I just wanted to say that I um, I was at the Capital Audio Fest and saw JR's first seminar um, on uh, cartridge, cartridges, styli, alignment tools, et cetera, and was really taken with it. And he had another seminar the next day and talked about and had a whole hour of t on, a, on totally different topics. And then he had a presentation in the room, uh, Larry Borden's room, which was uh, Gary Coe of Genesis and uh, Merrill Audio, Merrill Wetasinga. Um, and we, he, new things came up in that. So um, I was just blown away by how much good information JR uh, had and, and uh, both in his products and in his future developments and in the research he's doing. So uh, JR, if you want to unmute yourself, and I see you are. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, Thank you. All right. Um, so uh, to, to start things off, um, I, I want you to get into your presentation as soon as possible, but um, can you just give us a little bit of background on, on yourself, how you got into this and what Wally Tools is? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, and, and thanks for spending this time with me tonight. Um, I love talking about this stuff. And I think you figured that out in DC. Um, so I, uh, I've been an IDFL since 19. I'm uh, 52 right now and um, met uh, Wally. I lived in uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, was uh, born and raised there. And that's where I met Wally uh, probably 28 years ago. And um, we started a fast friendship and I realized that in Wally, I would learn a lot. And um, one thing people don't know much about Wally uh, is that they, know, they certainly know him for being an analog guru. He was a uh, acoustics guru as well. Lot and about acoustics, um, psychoacoustics, and um, and and so he, he passed away in 2018. I I, I, um, I I made a few of his products for him, not not much. Wally wasn't much of a business guy, and would far rather have conversations with audiophiles and do research and studies than actually make tools and ship them out and cash checks. When he passed away in 2018, we found thousands of dollars of uncashed checks in his house all over the place. He just um, wasn't, it just, he, didn't, he didn't have the, that organizational acumen. And, and he got pummeled for it online, um, uh, rightly so, for um, you know, taking payments and, and then not shipping, it, and, which is why he started a policy of, look, don't send me any money orders, only personal checks, and hopefully I'll cash it, right? Um, but um, and so he died in 2018, and I had no plans to do anything with this. Um, uh, but one day I was talking to his son, Andre, who is the um, head of R&D of Medtronic, and, um, uh, and mechanical engineer of his own right. And, and I said to him, you know what? Um, I loved your dad and I loved what he did, but there was so much more to do. And I'm interested in doing some of it. And I want to do it together. It can be my, my engineering check and resource. And so and there we went. I didn't expect that it would get into all these new products this quickly, but the more I learn, the more I realize how much I don't know. Right. And so then I go down that path. So what's going on down here? And I go down that path, what's going on down here? And so you're going to see some of those new paths today in this presentation. All right, great. Um, now, you said you would like to pro like to uh, go over some of the stuff you did in, in the first seminar at the Capital Audio Fest. Yeah, there. Are you seeing it? Yay. Okay. All right. <laughs> All, right. All right. And apologies for those who have already seen this, but... It, it is uh, dense material. There's a lot there. And even if you have seen it, maybe it'll be refreshed on, on some things. Um, I did add uh, that element on the impact of skating force on the cantilever angle video in here. So that was from day two. Um, so let me, let's see, where, here we go. So I just wanna set expectations for this, um, this seminar. This is advanced level material. 
Um, I'm assuming that you've got knowledge on how to set your overhang, how to set your cantilever alignment, your vertical tracking force. I'm, I assume that you know how to affect, but perhaps not measure your azimuth and rake angles. And then I assume that you know the difference between a fine line contact stylus and a conical or elliptical, all right? Um, uh, moving forward from there, if, if there is some background, perhaps we can take some, that, that, that you need, maybe we can take some time for that, but I'm gonna go headlong into the material. I'm gonna cover the what and the why, and I'm only gonna direct you to the how. I'm not gonna do it, um, I'm not gonna do the how you do these things on, the, um, on this. So let's start with how a, a lacquer is cut. This is an, uh, um, a great little GIF that I found um, online at Vinyl Recorder, how a right channel signal is cut. And as you can see, the, the cutter head stylus is cutting at a 45 degree angle, right? So left channel is just the opposite. And then you can see an illustration. Oh, let me turn on my, um, Right. And I'm going to turn on this little function here just a second so I can annotate with my spotlight. Okay. See my arrow? Yep. All right. And so this is what the groove would look like, right? Back to your next frame. Okay. Stop. Stopping here. I guess I got to stop it. Okay. Mono. Both of them are working together. And it makes a perfectly, when a mono signal is cut, it is, makes a perfectly horizontally modulated groove. Again, look at the top down, that's the illustration um, to the right. Now, if there's an instrumentation in the center between your two speakers on a stereo recording, maybe it's a voice of a singer or something, and it's right between your two speakers, that is done with a horizontally modulated groove, okay? Next, the stereo. So stereo, it's gonna be obviously all over the place. It's a miracle that we get what we do from these tiny little grooves. And I'll show you, here's a photograph that I took uh, from my, we use my lab microscope of the, um, a, a portion, a high frequency portion of the Ortifon uh, test records frequency suite. So this is probably somewhere around 18,000 Hertz um, uh, signal, at least according to the, uh, to, uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't measure it um, uh, frequency wise, but you can measure it mechanically here. And um, gold star, if anybody can catch the error, because there is one. <laughs> this was taken by tilting the microscope at a 45 degree angle and looking directly at the le um, left channel wall only, all right? Now, do you see these, uh, I'm gonna turn this on again. Do you see these, um, these, un these undulations, these horizontal undulations? That, that, is e that is effectively a sine wave that is mechanically imprinted into the groove and the left channel um, contact edge of the stylus is going to hit those. It's 11 microns peak to peak. Now, just to give you an idea of size here, relative size, in this entire frame, you could fit the diameter of a human hair. A human hair would fill up that frame completely. The human hair is about 100 microns. Uh, maybe Nordic hair is narrower than that, but the average human hair is about 100 microns. So about 3,700 magnification here. It is a miracle that we can actually get, we can read these tiny, tiny signals and hear it as music. Now, I'm gonna come back to this a little bit later. So there is, um, uh, it looks like I always have to turn off annotation to move to the next screen. Okay. Um, this is gonna be relevant. So I need to go over real quickly uh, the anatomy of a stylus. And again, the annotation. There are two radii, radii. This is the major radius. You see my marker? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the major radius. Actually, it's more down here. That's what matters because the part that touches the groove is probably right about there and right about there. So there's a radius here. All right, that's called the major radius. Now, 
the minor radius. So the minor radius, again, right here. Minor radius on a fine line contact stylus is anywhere from two and a half microns to say about five. After that, it's getting a little thick. Um, I'll go over why later on that that's, that's a little thick. So on the major radius that we just looked at, you're looking at between 40 and 70 microns. Again, you don't need to remember these numbers, but it's gonna be relevant a little bit later. Okay. Um, so there are three, my, my, everything that I've been doing for so far with Wally tools is to optimize the three orientation axes. Now, um, azimuth, uh, I think everybody knows what azimuth is. Um, um, zenith, I wish, what if I, I'm gonna stop the share just for a minute. Does everybody see me on, on their screen? Yeah, yeah. Okay, you see this model? All right. So that's a, that is, this is a 1,000 to 1 scale model of a groove and a stylus. Um, so azimuth is this axis, although we'll find out later it has nothing to do with the stylus, but it's this axis. Rake, of course, backward and forward, that'd be tantamount to raising or lowering your tone arm. However, a lot more happens when you raise and lower your tone arm. Again, I'll go into that. And then zenith. Zenith is kind of, the, as I call it, the new frontier, is the twisting in the twist, the relative twisting in the group. Okay. Now, screen share. All right. Um, but with, of course, with Zenith, um, we're using the cantilever as our proxy to read the groove uh, to align. Right, because we can't see the contact edges of the stylus. So and the that, setup goal. That's what we setup. do when we set up the offset, it, correct? Yeah. So what when we're you, really yeah, doing is adjusting zenith. When we call it, we're adjusting offset. We're really just we're really doing zenith. Yeah. yeah well, what you're when you uh, when you're aligning the cantilever for proper offset angle, you are aligning the cutter head, and that's it. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sorry. When you're aligning the cantilever for proper offset angle. All you're aligning is the cantilever. And we're assuming that the contact edges of the stylus are perpendicular to the cantilever. However, we now know, um, I now know I've gotten verification now that two of the three stylus manufacturers have a tolerance of plus minus five degrees. That's crazy. And what, what are the three manufacturers, by the way? Uh, three major manufacturers are um, Geiger in Switzerland and Ogura and Namiki in Japan. Okay, so the the goal of us the goal is to remain faithful to the azimuth, zenith, and rake angles of the lathe cutter head. Okay, try to replicate. So the question becomes, what was the cutter head aligned at? Now. Um, there are certainly tolerances that um, exist when they put the, the cutter head stylus into the chuck, all right? But what, one thing that we do know is that a, two of the three axes, it's beyond debate what they should be, okay? Azimuth, 90 degrees to the lacquer surface. There's zero reason why it would be anything else than 90 degrees to the lacquer surface. The zenith would be collinear with the radial line. So this is what we mean by collinear. You just go from the center of the lacquer and draw a line to the edge. The, 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 the cutter head stylus should be perfectly on that line, not to the side and certainly not diagonal to it. The image that you see there in the top right is an uh, image taken from a microscope of a cutter head. So, with rake, however, no standard exists. There is no standard. In fact, I could make a good argument that the quietest grooves are cut at less than 90 degrees. Um, how, the, the science that has been done on the ideal playback angle, however, because when you, when you cut, when, you, when this, the hot cutter head stylus, which is heated, when it cuts the soft lacquer, the lacquer, um, goes into a semi-liquid uh, liquefied state 
And there is something called once it cools, uh, once it's cut and cooled, there's some spring back. So even if it's cut at less than 90 degrees, it doesn't necessarily mean that that is the mechanical angle at which it bounces back to. More, more work to be done. But no standard actually exists for playback or for cutting. Okay. Um, I, I've seen now the best, the best science that's been done on the playback is, of course, the one, the one, whoops, the one that was done by um, Risch and Meyer in 1981 um, in Audio Magazine. But it's not very robust science. When, of course, they came out with having done intermodulation tests at a number of different uh, cutting houses throughout the US and came back with 92 degrees as being the goal. They didn't say whether that was dynamic or static. And I regularly measure, uh, you know, when I do my analyses, I always measure dynamics. So I know that there can be anywhere from a quarter degree to two and a quarter degrees um, difference between static and dynamic SRA. Um, azimuth, let's just cover azimuth a little bit. Um, why do we even care about optimizing it? Um, uh, ideal azimuth, to answer the question, let me go first. I, ideal azimuth, it's not a function of how the stylus or cantilever is oriented to the record. A lot of people think it is. A lot of people think, oh, well, if I just align the body, if I align the head shell, it's, it's good to go. No. <clears throat> um, you can, th this is a picture of, of a cartridge that is ideally aligned. Um, for its, its azimuth angle. Now, we can have a conversation as to whether uh, it left the factory with intolerances, but that's a 2.6 degree angle. <clears throat> and um, that's not only where it sounds best, it's where it measures best, okay? Now, remember I, I showed you that the anatomy of the, of the, the stylus that has a, a major radius. And that major radius offers a degree of forgiveness to allow the stylus to be at an angle, an azimuth angle, at a tilt in the groove um, without suffering um, any uh, mechanical consequences. That's why there's a radius on those sides of those cantilevers. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead. So, well, no, I, I'll... You you can I'm sorry you continue and then if I'm still confused at the end I'll ask. <laughs> okay, because if you need me to, I can I can stop the presentation to show the screen and show you my uh, my stylus. That, that that always seems to kind of help. <laughs> um, so changing uh, changing the stylus's angle of the groove doesn't impact crosstalk. Now, if it's egregious tilt of the stylus, it can cause other problems, but that's for another another discussion. So I did um, an animation in CAD of, of what really is going on when you're measuring asthma. So watch this video. All right, so the cantilever, the stylus is actuating at a 45 degree angle because remember how those record grooves are cut, right channel only, which means that that coil, the white coil is right channel and that's moving in the magnetic field and that's exciting. The, the, uh, an electrical signal. And you notice that the red wasn't moving. Now you spin the coils. Okay. If you misalign the coils, the groove wall and the right channel coil are no longer aligned. So now, as you can see, the red, which is the other channel, is moving just a little bit even though there is no signal in the groove for that coil, right? Was that clear? Right. Okay. All right. So how to optimize azimuth and where to start. By the way, you know, I, the, I don't remember if I say it here, but the azimuth is always the last step, last step in your, in your um, setup process. You got to use electrical measurements. There is no, I'd love to be able to measure it mechanically because I don't like multivariate tests at all. And I'll go into that a little bit later. Um, but there's no way to visually see the, and measure the angle of the, um, the, the coils in the magnetic field. 
So you have to take an electrical measurement. You need a left, right, one kilohertz signal. Um, you could use various azimuth measurement products like the fuzzgometer. Um, uh, I think the FICAR is now out of production, I think. I, I heard that, I'm not sure if it's the case. Um, or you can use a digital multimeter. Um, if you go to the Wally School blog uh, and, and read the articles I did on azimuth, eventually you'll follow the breadcrumbs and you'll lead to analog planet where Michael's um, already got the steps to use a digital multimeter. It is the last step to perform in the setup process. Make sure it is. Um, it, everything is interrelated in these three axes. If zenith is off, I'm gonna get a different result for azimuth, my ideal azimuth angle, than if I correct for zenith. Um, indirect azimuths may need one more step. So in, in, what is an indirect azimuth tone arm? Um, so an indirect azimuth tone arm, uh, there are two things to consider. Uh, an indirect azimuth tone arm will have a straight arm one, and it will have no, I mean, I'm, gonna sh I'm gonna stop the share for a minute. Okay, and I'm gonna take the cam, and it will have no offset yoke. You see this Kuzma tone arm? Mm -hmm. All right, I'll take my gummy thing, sticky stuff. See how the horizontal, the horizontal bearing is at an angle to the arm wand? It's called an offset yoke. That makes this a true azimuth tone arm, not an indirect. This over here, uh, the 4.9, that is an indirect because it does not have an, an offset yoke, okay? So those will, may require one more step, why? And a quick question, and with an S-shaped tone arm, does it, well, do, is that? Uh, that's a true azimuth. That's true azimuth. That's okay. true azimuth. An S or a J shaped um, uh, tone arm, uh, arm wand uh, is going to be a, a true azimuth. Yes. Okay. Am I in the frame? <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Let's go back to my share screen. All right. Um, the one more step is the reason why there's potentially one more step is is that on arms that are indirect, when you change azimuth, you're also changing rake. And I got a calculator on the Wally Tools website uh, to, so that you can play around and just learn. Well, if I do a one and a half degree azimuth um, change on my 300 millimeter effective length tone arm, what will my impact be to my rake? So there it is, Some test records, oh God. So recently I did a, I did a study uh, of eight different test records. Um, and I, I wanted to measure, I was looking for a whole, dump, I had a whole completely different hypothesis I was working on. And I didn't find what I was looking for, but what I did find is that um, the, <laughs> if these eight different test records gave me completely different answers as to where my ideal azimuth angle should be. The variation from one end to the other was slightly more than one and a half degrees. Now, one and a half degrees, azimuth is really sensitive to minor changes, um, subjectively, right? Um, that blew me away. What does that mean? It means that at the, in these cutting houses, at, in the, in the, at these lathes, not all these guys are being careful. They're creating a test record. Which one's the right one? Which one was made with a cutter head stylus that was perfectly uh, perpendicular to the lack of service? I don't know. I mean, I, of all the eight records, and I purchased some more since then, I can tell you where the greatest density is, but does that mean where that's where perpendicular is? I don't know. So, um, uh, JR, let me back you up one second. You had mentioned that um, it's the, the zenith error and the uh, azimuth are interrelated. Yeah. And, yeah. and since uh, even in a properly set up tone, uh, tone arm with a properly mounted stylus diamond, it's only going to be perfectly accurate at two points, correct? Uh, uh, you mean the, you're talking about for the zenith? 
for the zenith, right? Uh, uh, so yes, yes. So Anna. now these test records. Uh, um, for instance, I have the acoustic sounds, and mm -hmm. the left and right one K signals are in the second and third bands, mm -hmm. which are close to, but not exactly, on you know the bare walled you're, point. You're getting it. You're nailing it. So, <laughs> so like. If I set up, I, I would imagine that where these companies put their test tones on the record is is going to make a, a significant difference then. Definitely. Definitely. And few of them are sensitive to that. Hmm. Yes. And, and guys, I, I just, just back up for a minute. I want to make clear that, <clears throat> you, you, I mean, you see me diving deep here, right? Um, I will... I will never say that if you've got a misaligned stylus that you can't have wonderful, enjoyable music. You can. But as you'll see here, and I'll, I'll prove it for it's a mechanical certainty that if it's not aligned properly and you have a fine line contact stylus, it's a mechanical certainty you won't get all of the information from the groove. And I'll prove it. Okay? So these test records, in addition to having these cutter head stylus misalignments, have a huge difference in their amplitude um, from the quietest one, which was the Cardis, which is no longer in print and is my favorite, unfortunately, um, to the loudest one. There's a 16 decibel var uh, variation that 16 decibels is unacceptable. It, it was way louder than any music that we would play. Why is that a problem? When you've got a higher amplitude, you've got a higher coefficient of friction. There's more friction. When there's more friction, there's more skating force. When there's more skating force, what's happening to that the cantilever? It's getting pulled over more towards the, um, towards the spindle. And when that happens, your zenith there is going, getting worse. So um, I'll go more into skating force and, and such in a little bit. So yeah, about one and a half degree variation across eight test records. So stylus rate, I mentioned the Risch and Meyer study that, is, uh, that says that 92 degrees is the ideal playback based on their intermodulation distortion test, even though I'm suspicious about whether intermodulation distortion tests are even the right way to determine that. <clears throat> there have been other publications in the Journal of Audio Engineering, but most of them focus on the angle of the cantilever which I don't care about the angle of the cantilever within limits. I don't care about it. I'm not so. And I mentioned that I think the quietest grooves, um, not think, um, we've got, we, we could back this up. Uh, now is not the time for it. The quietest groove will be cut at less than 90. Um, I mentioned the spring back. It's an incomplete science. Okay. But, um, and so this is, this is now, remember that image I showed you early on a microscopic image of the left channel group, left channel groove, right, of the test signal. Now, if you imagine that each one of these, this is an exaggerated view. Imagine that each one of those, those undulations that you saw that were formerly oriented horizontally, now they are represented by these bars oriented vertically. But notice what's happening is that with a rake angle that's different from what the stutter, cutter head was, uh, the stylus was cutting at, what will happen is that the stylus um, contact edge will skip from peak to peak, okay, rather than reaching down into the undulations. This will only happen at very high frequency, probably only at 33 RPM, and it'll be worse at the inner area of the record. But, um, and I'll, I'll go this a little bit, later when we talk about the finite element analysis that we've been doing, we have yet to find mm, a mechanical reason why rake angle should matter. Mechanical, in the mechanical relationship between the, the stylus and the groove. But we have many, many different variations of groove types to go through yet, but we haven't seen it yet. So far, changing rake angle um, what we do see is that when you change rake angle, it'll change the height at, in the groove at which the stylus will contact the groove. So
So how do you optimize rake angle? Um, microscopic expansion, uh, inspe inspection only. Again, I'm gonna go later why I really don't like multivariate tests. Microscopic inspection is an example of a univariate test where you, you are measuring only that one parameter, that bit of data that you care about rather than worrying about other data that will obfuscate the one parameter you care about. So, but it's the dynamic rake angle that matters, not the static meaning, dynamic meaning, what, what angle does it, when, when you put a, a stylus onto a record that's not moving, and then you start the platter spinning, it's gonna cause drag and it's gonna cause the cantilever to drop down. Cantilever drops down, well, that changes rake angle. <clears throat> um, so, and I, as I mentioned before, I've seen as much as two and a quarter degree change between that static and dynamic. That's pretty big. Uh, but it usually it's in the neighborhood of one degree. So it's not that much, but uh, usually in the neighborhood of one degree. And, and I recommend two steps for measuring it. Um, the measure of the stylus contact edge and its relationship to the cantilever. And then at a lower magnification, and you can even do this with a cell phone, then you measure the cantilever's angular relationship to a moving record surface. So I'm, I'm just about to release the, the Wally scope and included in the Wally scope is a trimmed record where I take, I, I go hunting at, at uh, Goodwill, buy all the garbage, easy listening stuff. And then I, I put it on my table router and I route off the outer five millimeters or so of the lip. Why? So that you can put the stylus right at the very, very, very edge of the record and it's in the groove so that when you, take an image with the microscope, the record surface and the stylus and cantilever will be in focus. Um, so yeah, that's an example of the, the, the two shots that um, I, I suggest to take and measure in order to get your dynamic rake angle. The image on the right was taken with the Wally scope on a moving record. Right. Uh, Xenothera, my favorite. <laughs> um, we talked about already that you know we align the cantilever because that's what we can see, but that's not what matters because the cantilever doesn't read the groove. And it just... yeah, that's what I got. What's that? I don't know what I'm what are you just... uh, Somebody unmuted their mic. I'm gonna okay. mute them. Okay, okay. Go, sorry, go ahead. And, and so in this image here, you'll see that not only is the, the diamond block, which is, uh, let, me see. let me put this on again. This is the diamond block, okay? That, not only is that slightly misaligned to the cantilever, but the stylus itself is misaligned within the diamond block. But the part that matters is right here. That's the only thing I care about. So when I take these images, I don't care about the margins of the, of, of the, of the stylus shank. I care about this. Okay. kind of a low resolution image, but so um, how, how does Zenithera create a problem for optimizing your playback? Three things, and I'll show you, I'll illustrate this in, in some drawings. Incomplete excursion, meaning if the groove set, if the groove offers freedom of movement, left, right, five microns, it's not gonna go that far. It will go four microns or something less. Tracing error, I'll show you what that means, and pinch effect, I'll show you. All right, so here's a very crude drawing of how a cutter head forms a groove. Cutter heads typically, typically have about a two micron um, sharp edge and they go zigzag, zigzag, and they cut the groove, right? Now, <clears throat> we're gonna start out by looking at a conical stylus profile. So this is a top-down illustration of if you have a conical stylus, how, does it, how is it gonna travel through the groove? Well, the first thing you notice, it's got this incomplete excursion. The, 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 the stylus will not reach all the way, and this is an exaggerated view, but it, it's, it's for the, so you can understand the principle. The stylus won't reach all the way over to the bottom of the group. So it's not reading all of the signal, okay? Next, tracing error. So tracing error means that the left channel signal and the right channel signal are out of phase with each other. 
they're reading the groove differently in time. Now, this is very small, and it's, a, and it's most noticeable, uh, most measurable and noticeable at higher frequencies only. And it's only in the single digits of, um, of, of a phase error in the high, in the high frequencies only. Um, but uh, it's, it's just one of three situations that tracing error causes. Next thing, there's vertical modulation. And this is the big one. You notice how this, th this uh, contact pattern of the, the, on the bottom, the contact pattern on the groove and the, uh, of the um, stylus uh, shape, the spherical stylus shape at the bottom is larger than the other two. Well, that, that represents the fact that the stylus has to bounce in and out of the groove in order to stay, in order to trace an otherwise perfectly horizontal groove because it, it's not the same shape as the cutter head. So ellipticals improve upon this, but they still have the same problems, just to a lesser degree. They still have the same um, uh, uh, incomplete excursion, tracing error, and pinch effect. Now, a fine line contact stylus profile is just for all intents and purposes, the very, very similar or almost the same as a um, cutter head stylus. But if it's exhibiting a zenith error, it starts to behave like an elliptical or a um, spherical if it's really bad. What's happening here is that now this, this misaligned um, fine line contact stylus uh, on its zenith is getting pinched. It cannot make its way through this groove any longer unless it comes upward. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I'm really fortunate to have a partner who's uh, a mechanical engineer of the highest order, and he's got a huge team of people behind him with lots of resources, and we can get a lot of stuff done. And we have access to fantastic equipment, and in this case, amazing software. So this is um, an animation that was done in um, a finite element analysis software, which, if you can get it, is... Um, about $25,000 a year or so. And so here's what, what we got. On the left, we, on the left we've got uh, a stylus that's perfectly oriented in the groove. And on the right, we've got one with Zenith there, okay? Now the groove is, these grooves are identical on the left and the right. And the grooves have just two sine waves in them, about 3,500 Hertz and about 6,500 Hertz. Okay, and it's horizontally modulated only. There's no vertical content to these groups. So I'm going to play the video, and I want you to watch these these springs um, that are above the x y z axis, as well as watching the action of the styli. So again, the gray represents the stylus contact edge, and on the left, you're seeing it just go left, right, left, right, left, right, and the one on the right. Uh, it's pretty obvious, particularly when you look at that spring, it's going in an ovular pattern. There's no vertical content to this group. Hmm. And when I saw this, I just, uh, you know, I, we had <clears throat> inferred that this was probably the case. And then when we made, when we made the, um, the, this 1001 scale stylus, we saw it was happening with this 1001 scale stylus. And I thought, well, that's not enough. Let's prove it. Let's prove it mathematically. So we've even got a formula for it now too. And um, uh, there's a formula that defines the vertical action in an otherwise horizontally modulated groove given a certain zenith error and a whole host of other variables. But so um, problem is, uh, <laughs> And this is the part that makes me uncomfortable. I don't know of any other way to measure zenith error right now, unless you send it to me, because nobody's measuring for it. Um, I think I know that the stylus manufacturers can, 
And I know that they don't always, like for example, there's one, I won't name it. I know that one major one in, in Japan, they've got the production department and then the measuring department. And the measuring department can measure for xenothera. Um, but the manu cartridge manufacturers who are purchasing these stylus cantilever assemblies have to pay extra for their stylus cantilever assemblies to go to the measuring department. And then, even though they're going to the measuring department, they are still not guaranteed anything tighter than plus minus five degrees air. Now, um, in order to measure zenith air, I had to get a microscope that costs more than my car. Um, and I find that unacceptable um, that such expense has to be made, uh, has to be paid in order to accomplish this. We are working on two different product paths, two totally different product paths to make a way for people to be able to measure it on their own. Um, and I have um, been in discussions with more than one cartridge manufacturer, helping them put together a microscopy program. Um, this stuff is measurable, but it's difficult to measure. You can see Zenith error with a decent microscope, but measuring it is a whole other matter. Okay, um, so, but there is a way to subjectively test for zenith error. Um, the evaluation material, uh, here, here's what, you, so a few, I, as far as I know, only Chad, Kassim, and in the older days, uh, classic records, made the same high quality um, pressing in both 33 and 45. If you have that situation where you've got the same, same production um, from the same production house in both 33 and 45, you have an opportunity to test subjectively for potential zenith error. <clears throat> um, classical orchestral is what I recommend to use because the complexity of, of the groove content, the complexity of the instrumentation and the big sound field and the lots of depth uh, gives you the best chance of being able to, to discern any Zenith error issues. Um, so you would start out using 35 RPM version and only the innermost track, okay? So 35 RP, 33 RPM, innermost track, listen to it, and then find that same track on the 45 RPM. Doesn't matter where it is on the 45 RPM, but those are the two to compare, and you're going to listen for, and this is this is this, these are the subjective impacts of a zenith era. Sound stage will shrink. Uh, front to back instrumentation layering starts to disappear. Image specificity suffers. So instead of having pinpoint imaging, they're kind of diffuse. Um, overall sense of musical intelligibility and coherence definitely suffers. High frequency decay. So you know, that cymbal splash, instead of having this nice long decay, it's truncated. And then the dynamic slam suffers as well. These are all the subjective impacts of Zenith Air. Okay. Um, we're getting near the end. And then I, I look forward to the questions. So a, a, quick, a, a quick run over of univariate versus multivariate testing. Univariate testing is when you assess data involving input from only one variable. This is the simplest form of analyzing data. It's the most um, reliable um, way of analyzing data. And microscopy is an example. Just measure it directly, okay? Multivariate, however, um, this, uh, this is a situation where you, you involve a number of independent variables where you only care about one, but other variables are gonna affect the data collected. And I gave you an example earlier, um, measuring azimuth for a, a, your ideal azimuth angle when you're measuring crosstalk. The figures you get, and ultimately the angle at which you set your ideal azimuth are going to change depending on your zenith, right? So, and, and so it becomes a real iterative process. It's time consuming and you'll never really know if you got it right. You'll never, the removal of doubt is a pretty much an impossibility. 
of whether you've isolated it to the ideal, uh, your parameter that you currently care about, if you've isolated it you know, to your ideal M uh, approach angle. Okay. And it's of course, test record specific. I mean, you're trusting that test that the, the, the cutter head, because you're using a test record, you're trusting that the engineers got it spot on. So I, I don't like multivariate testing. Azimuth is the one test where we can't get away from it. <clears throat> okay, a skating and anti-skating force. Um, I honestly don't understand the controversy. I don't understand why, why some, why there's a controversy of one, whether it's important to have anti-skating or not, and two, how much to apply. So coefficient of friction tests were done in the 50s and 60s by a number of different um, out, uh, outfits. Those papers are still out there, available to read, um, mostly on Journal of, um, Journal of uh, Audio Engineering Society. And they all agree with each other um, that, co that they confirm that about 10% of your VTF should be applied to anti-skate force for most mu musical playback on average, right? Now, of course, skating forces is a product of a few different things and coefficient of friction is one of them. There are a number of other variables as well. But on average, 10%. I recently saw a video that was sent to me. It was from Russia and it was in Russian. It got translated. A guy had set up this really interesting experiment using a water basin and a tone arm floating on the water basin. And he was measuring the, um, the, the frictional effects of, of, of the playback. And so um, Andre, my partner and I, we did, he, he gave enough information that we could do the calculations. And we determined he found the same thing as the guys in the 50s and 60s. 10% of your VTF is gonna keep things steady. Um, Anti-skating, when you don't set it properly, it guarantees incorrect zenith alignment and in free rolling unipivots, I suspect, but I haven't measured this yet. I intend to, I've got one right here. I believe it also, it may also change azimuth. Um, I'm gonna show you a video, okay? See this, this video, watch, it's, it's of um, a SoundSmith cartridge. And you'll notice it's the, the record stops and it starts, but look at the cantilever angle at static and dynamic. Look at that angle change. Hmm. You see that? Okay. You saw that? Yeah. Good. Okay. So we measured it 2.4 degrees. That's 2.4 degrees. Now, your cantilever angle just changed 2.4 degrees. So you've spent all this energy. And effort, of course, this is, this, you know, horizontal compliance of the cartridge is gonna change this. And of course, groove amplitude and all that stuff. But this is just one cartridge and I haven't, I, I've done two of these and they're roughly the same. So I wasn't cherry picking for the softest cartridge as a soundsmith. Um, so you go through all this effort to align your cantilever very well with a, a your protractor, preferably while you tractor, and you don't apply anti-skating at all. And as soon as you start the record, boom, your efforts are off by, in this case, 2.4 degrees. Done. Why bother? <laughs> so skating, and, you know, it's, it's more than just about preservation of the stylus because your stylus will wear out faster in the left channel if you do not have an anti-skate force, okay? So uh, there's the question, right? Before aligning the cantilever at null points, how do you know is your tone arm is gonna play nice? So, well, actually it's a different question. So a lot of, a lot of tone arms, uh, unbeknownst to the owner, especially this is particularly the case with many free rolling unit pivots, um, have horizontal forces native to the arm. And I'm talking about when anti-skating is off completely that's pushing the arm one way or the other, okay? And that's what the Wally skater, one of the things that the Wally skater is good for is to measure, is your arm pushing one way or the other? Because if it is more than about five, 
if it's pushing on its own, one, one way or the other, then when you drop your stylus down to the protractor to align it, what's what's your tone arm going to let me? I'm going to stop sharing. Mm -hmm. When you when you drop your stylus down to the protractor, what's it going to do? It's going to do this. Boop. Yeah, right. As soon as that vertical dragon force is applied, it's going to boop. And now when you're looking at it from the front, it looks like you need to rotate the cartridge to get it into position. But you just screwed up your zenith now because the problem wasn't the offset angle. The problem was the cartridge is being, being pushed over by internal forces. Now those internal forces, what are they? Almost always it's, um, it's the tone arm wires have been t twisted incorrectly or too, too much, right? But if you don't know it exists by measuring it, then you then aligning aligning your cantilever it's it's going to be out. If you do know it exists, then there is a trick to eliminate it. Well, of course, the first thing is to try to redress the wires if you can. Sometimes it's a bad bearing. Uh, I think I'm I'm pretty much done here. Oh yeah, I think this is the last slide. So what is not the sound of misaligned styles? So sometimes. Um, people will call me and they'll say, um, hey, uh, I just, I just, it doesn't happen very often, but once in a while I get a call saying, I just realigned the, the stylus cord in the Wally tractor and set everything up with the cool tools. And I can tell it sounds really, really great. But um, on high frequencies, I'm getting, I'm getting a, a, a sibilance. Some distortion, some sibilance. Misalignment will, the, and my answer every time is this has nothing to do with alignment. You've revealed another problem. Okay. And the problem I find about 50% of the time is they've been using the gel cleaners. <laughs> and they need to get that off about 50% of the time, but 30% of the time they've got um, their tone arm is as the, the either their anti skate is way off or they're, not enough or there's something going on with horizontal forces in their tone arms that need to be fixed. And um, uh, other times what, what, it, what it is, so now remember when you misalign, when you realign the stylus, you can actually change the height at which the, um, the, 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 the stylus reads the group, all right? It might be reading higher, it might be reading lower. So on a very rare occasion, um, what they're reading is previously damaged grooves that they were missing before because they were riding higher or riding lower. That's very rare. And the way to check it is to have, you know, bring it over to a friend's or try another record of the same type or whatnot. It's very rare, but that happens too. Um, that is it. All right. Um, so before I open it up uh, to, to everyone else, just a, a couple of uh, simple questions about what you do at home. Um, so like I have, Stylast, Blue Tack, Mr. Clean Magic Eraser, uh, a little brush that came with a cartridge. I have a lens brush, and I have a yeah. one of those vibrating yeah. brushes. Yes. Um, what do you clean your stylus with? Okay, so uh, I love the dry brushes. I love the dry brushes. <clears throat> I do that before every record side and every one or two weeks, I'll put one drop of fluid on there and I'm kind of fluid agnostic right now mm -hmm. um, and give it a wet clean. Um, I do, I, I prefer to stay away from, well, definitely prefer to stay away from solvents and, and alcohol. Okay. Um, I mean, I've got a variety of different things here I'm trying, but I don't, I'm not, I'm not putting a, any effort into determining, at least not yet, determining what I what I like best. I, I don't know what I like best. Um, the blue tack, you know, I get a lot of respect for Peter Letterman, and Peter Letterman um, has seen a lot of styly um, up close and personal in his microscopy. If he um, says that the blue tack doesn't leave any res residue, I'm inclined to believe him. Right. Um, but, um, the, the concern about the gel cleaner in particular, 
Anzo. I, I wonder if it's breaking down with UV exposure or whatnot. Um, uh, I, I have not tested a fresh one. I just, I've been getting, uh, I've, I've been getting um, clients samples come in um, of other cartridges and, and I've, I've just been seeing a lot of it. <laughs> so wh whatever the cause, it's a potentially dangerous way to clean your stylus or not, certainly not optimum. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I don't, I don't think it will ruin a stylus, but um, I'm quite sure that it, it's depositing its material into your grooves okay. because the only part of the stylus that's ever always, always clean is the contact edges. Mm -hmm. So uh, one other question, uh, th this is kind of a um, off topic a little bit, uh, but your personal front end, uh, can you describe it from cartridge to phono stage? What, what do you use at home? Um, so uh, cartridge, um, I, I, I'm, I'm blessed to have a number of different ones from good people in the industry. I'm really enjoying uh, the Hanawas. Um, I really enjoy them. Um, I, the Lyras are always fantastic. Um, the the Atnor, the Atlas. Um, very different cartridges than the Hanawa. All right. Um, and so I'm, I play with, I play with those and uh, there's a number of others that I, I really like, but those, those are my areas, of, the, my two areas of focus. Um, on my main rig, it's a Kuzma four point on an SME 30, which is sits on top of a minus K platform. Um, that feeds a uh, past lab to XP 25. Rick, uh, Rick Becker, you were up first. Uh, you want to ask a question? Yeah, yeah you, you had mentioned uh, the twisting wire, the twisting of wires in the tone arm. Are you talking about the wires internally in the tone arm or coming off the back end of the tone arm or between the tone arm and the cartridge? Both, both. Sometimes, um, you know, many tone arms don't have any exposed uh, wires at all until it comes out at, as the cable. I have seen instances where the, the tone arm wires inside and hidden to us uh, of the tone arm have been either misrouted or they're heavily twisted. Of course, we learned about this after the fact if we send it back to the manufacturer to say, hey, tell us what's going on here. Um, but more often than not, it, it's, it's going to be uh, with a, a tone arm like the, you know, the 4 point or the 4.9 where you've got the loop coming out. Um, or the you know the VPIs um, where you got the loop coming out that that puts a lot of um, can put a lot of pressure horizontal pressure on the arm a lot and and the more I, it gets worse the heavier that insulation is the more likely it is to do that so you want really fine fine lightweight wire ideally to avoid that in many cases I've seen. Uh the tone arm, uh, uh, the cartridge wires from the, between the tone arm and the cartridge have been like twisted into a bundle to keep them, I, I don't know what, but is that a good practice? Between the cartridge and where it enters the tone arm? Yeah, the, the tiny little uh, tone arm wires, yeah. Um, I've never seen that. Um, and well, as, yeah, as opposed to having them go off in four different directions, uh, they kind of twist them into one kind of uniform cable. I think the premise was to uh, uh, try and avoid uh, some RFI. If I'm not well, mistaken. that would only work if there is a common mode rejection opportunity, and that will only happen if you're running a balanced input on your phono stage. If you're right. running a balanced input on phono stage, then you want uniformity with that twist, right? Because then you want all four wires to be equally infected, right? So that there is common mode rejection, but if you're not running a, a balanced um, balanced phono stage, then it will probably have little to no effect. Right, and I have a a, a Leno C with a balanced cable, so I'm running fully balanced from the cartridge to the phono. Um, I got one right here. Open oh, and uh, <laughs> and my uh, and my tone arm wire is very fine and very twisted, but that. Um, but it stays balanced all the way through to the phono stage. 
I, sh I should have also added that I do have this Lino C uh, mm -hmm. 3.0, which I'm still getting familiar with and I think is a fantastic value. Oh, good. Yeah, I have the, I have the older one, the 2.0, but it, I think it, it works well if you have the right cartridge. I guess the 3.0, uh, you, you can add, uh, it's a little more functional with uh, different impedance cartridges and different output cartridges. Yeah, exactly. So I, yeah. With the one I have, I have to pick a low impedance cartridge period, end of discussion, but, uh, but that's okay because there are lots of good ones out there. Yeah. Um, so, um, Rick, were you done uh, with your question? Okay, uh, Don, you want to ask? Hi. So I have my my dealer is Bruce Heinberg at Stereo Unlimited. I just retained the I got a fairly new um, VPI Prime turntable with the new Fat Boy tone arm and the Lyra or Lyra Delos cartridge. Sounds great. I have last number nine. He says use this almost every side. And then after every five or 10 sides, I have last number four. Yes. Wow. And then about every 20 times to use last number five. Oh, jeez. I don't even know the differences of all these. <laughs> I don't either. <clears throat> but I also do have a little dry horsehair brush. So if I see a lot of crud, if I, if I see a lot of dust, I'll use the horsehair brush. And otherwise, I'll use the number nine. And it's interesting. <clears throat> excuse me that even after one side play, I can sort of see the cantilever and the stylus. And then when I give it one little brush with any of these fluids, it almost disappears. I can't even see it. So that's how much dirt was on there. Now, am I accumulating any crud on my stylus with using these? I would think not. Well, I, I certainly hope not. I, I don't know enough about any of the contents, you know, so yes, we did send samples off of the gel cleaner, a couple of the gel cleaners for- I've infrared. never heard of a gel cleaner. Oh, okay, well, well, well good. <laughs> <laughs> um, for, we sent them off for infrared spectrometry to understand what the materials are and to determine whether they're more likely to be transmissible of their material to the stylus after UV exposure or heat exposure or time, right? Um, um, but I won't be able to do that same type of testing on all of the stylus cleaners. I, I, I don't really care for being consumer reports <laughs> because it put, gives it puts a target on your back and it, it makes, it makes, uh, make, can make some enemies as well. And that's not what I meant to do this, but I saw too much of this, not to say something with regards to the Anzo. I, I just, I saw too much. I have a follow-up question. Yeah. I've been trying to get uh, something vinylized, so I've been trying to find mastering places. Um, Red Spade Records in Ottawa, Canada is a woman. She's the only female cutter in all of Canada, and she cuts one LP at a time. She does not press. If you hire her, she's going to cut you <laughs> one new LP piece of vinyl at a time. Yes. And then um, I'm in San Diego. And just up the road from me in Santa Ana is Sound Affair Mastering, owned by a guy named Ron Leeper. And he's done work for a lot of the big labels and uh, looks like a beautiful uh, layout that he has. Uh, is anybody here familiar with any of those or you've heard of any of them? Or, um, and generally, the world of vinyl is certainly expanding and growing because both of these two places have a six month backlog if you want to get something pressed or or cut from any of them, it's a, a six month waiting list. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the entire industry production industry is, is way behind. They're stacked up for a long time. They're, and everything's in short supply, the lacquers, the styli, um, uh, the tapes, even, even the, the tapes for the main recording. There are, those are getting harder and harder to get. In fact, I was told by one person that the price of the blank tape has gone up 25% in the last year. <clears throat> Everything's in short supply. Yeah. So I, I have a question about the quality control and the fact that there are only three manufacturers. Three main of, ones, yeah. Three yeah. main ones. There are. Um, 
some cartridge manufacturers do their own stylus cantilever assemblies like um oh i'm drawing a blank uh it's all made from uh, ceramics and wow. it's quite expensive exquisite how do how do the cartridge manufacturers do quality control do they uh you know obviously if 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 i'm a, 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 a a micro ridge stylus on a boron cantilever is going to be expensive. They can't very well just like look at them and throw out 50% of them because they're not quite right. uh, aligned correctly. <clears throat> right. What, what do they do about that? Well, so I know that um, the, not, I don't know about all of them, but I know like, for example, Lyra, th those guys really care about the product they're putting out and, they do, uh, they do everything that they can to inspect everything that comes in and make sure that it is within Namiki or Agura's agreed upon tolerances. And unfortunately, they like everybody else, as far as I've been able to tell, with a possible exception of, of Ortofon um, and maybe Soundsmith, um, don't have a means to measure the relationship between the contact edge and the cantilever. That's the zenith error, right? What they look at is larger features, which are easier to see, right? Like the diamond block. I showed you guys the diamond block. They'll make sure that's aligned properly. Or the, the, the stylus shank itself, when you're looking straight down on it from its zenith. Um, but the, seeing the contact edge and illuminating that contact edge is tough. And also have that contact edge in focus with uh, simultaneously with the cantilever, very that that that's the tough part. Mm -hmm. So um, you know these these uh, I, I don't know about Geiger, but I do know uh, about the other two on the zenith. Like I said, plus minus five degree tolerance on uh, on the zenith. Usually um, it's between it, usually it's around three degrees on the other axes. Yeah. Because you know, the, I have seen I've seen styli where uh, the, the 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 shank was mounted nicely, diamond block was mounted nicely, but the stylus wasn't cut very well. So the the contact edge is not an orthogonal relationship with the stylus uh, shank. Or I've even seen a few where the left channel. And the right channel, instead of when you're looking straight down on it, it looks like a straight line. But I've seen this. Mm. <laughs> so, you know, you said it's a miracle that the that we can get any sound or that we can get such good sound out of the grooves. It's a miracle that these styluses, particularly the the hyper ellipticals, can be uh, manufactured and polished correctly in the first place. I mean, yeah, it's, it, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, the technology uh, technology for micro machining has, has apparently gotten a hell of a lot better in the last uh, but 12, 10, 12 years. Yeah, but they've been making those since, um, you know, quad records back in the 70s, right? Yeah. yeah, and I don't know if they're still using the same machinery from back in the 70s or not. I, I don't know. But, uh, God, it, it, yeah. there's... There, there, I see that there's a question in the chat. Yeah, Arnie, go ahead. I'm sorry, Arnie, go ahead. Yeah, what, what it seems to me from what you demonstrated, how the uh, various stylus uh, configurations touch the groove, it, uh, the only stylus that has any chance of getting all the information out of the groove is the um, uh, straight line uh, uh, touch, one that touches the elliptical and the... Um, Conical miss a lot of information. That's correct. Well, so it's what? not just missing the information. It's the induced excursion that they have to, uh, the, the induced excursion that they have to um, have to get through the groove at all, right? So with a horizontally modulated stylus with no vertical content, a conical or elliptical and a, a, a fine line that's, got a zenith error of any significance is going to go like this. So it's create is what it's doing with that vertical motion. It's creating secondary harmonic distortion. And some people might like that. Okay. But I don't want it mechanically. 
Yeah, I've got some single-ended triodes that sound great. And they got a lot of single-ended, they got a lot of secondary harmonic distortion, but I don't want it at the very outset of my playback chain. So yes, they are, if you've got, if you've got a conical, definitely, if you've got elliptical, definitely, um, you won't mechanically get everything from the groove. So it, it seems to me that when you said that, you know, some of these things produce something euphonic and so on, uh, <clears throat> my approach always been has been uh, uh, sort of analytical in that I want to get everything off the groove uh, that's that's there and all this other stuff, whether it's euphonic or not, there are many, many ways of making things euphonic all along the system. Yeah. including how you treat your room, blah, blah, blah. Exactly. So, exactly. And, and the other thing is this, we also know, the only thing that matters to be accurate is what's at the beginning of the system, because it's going to get screwed up as long you go along the yeah. whole path yeah. into Never Never Land. Yeah. So I don't see why you would want to make anything euphonic right there yeah. at the stylus position, yeah. which is the most critical point in the system. Yeah, yeah. And, and by making it, if you're deliberately, inter, you're deliberately trying to get some of that euphonic nature, you're going to give up other things. You're, it, it, you're going to give up a big soundstage. You're going to give up pinpoint imaging. You're going to give up high frequency extension and decay. And you're going to give up dynamics. And I, I completely agree with you. There's so many other opportunities to screw things up. Let's not do it mechanically at the very beginning of the chain. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. For the uh, before I come back to Rick, uh, Paul Comrance <clears throat> uh, uh, messaged me that he had a question. Paul, you want to uh, ask away? Thank you, Mark. Mm -hmm. Here Hi, Paul. Um, love your talk. Thanks. I have a VPI Aries 1, and I use the VPI jig to set that up. How much am I missing by just setting up my toad arm with the VPI jig versus uh, all the other hoops I could potentially be jumping through? Oh, that's an excellent question, and I don't know. Um, Wally, Wally used to say to me, <clears throat> he said, Sometimes you know, I, he says, I love to talk to these audio files. We talked for hours. I talked to this guy today. Da, 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 da. And, but when they ask me, well, if I get your tools, Wally, how much improvement will I get? And his answer is always, I don't know how screwed up your system is right now. <laughs> so um, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, it, it's, it's, I, I can't make it, that kind of claim. Uh, the only claim I can make is that I've got some mechanical certainty with the tools that I do make, right? Um, if you were, say, let's say you had a ray guy, okay? It, I could be a little bit more specific about that, answering that question, because Rega uses a Stevenson alignment, right? Which uh, I can't find a single good reason to use because it favors a portion of the record, which we almost never ever play at, at the expense of 95% of every record you have. So, um, you know, that I could, I could answer. Um, and I've measured 1300 plus record sides to see where that last groove is over based on musical genre and, um, and data and uh, data production. So, uh, you know, if we're a regular, I could give you a better answer, but um, I, I'm sorry, I can't give you anything specific there, Paul. Thank you. Okay. Maybe in the future you can get your hands on a VPI and uh, play around with it. Yeah, lot, I haven't. I haven't. A lot either. of people who, uh, you know, a lot of audio files own VPI turntables. So, uh, well, what I, I can say this, um, if you're not aligning your cantilever on a mirrored surface, then you're at a significant disadvantage. Sorry, the car alarm <laughs> going. Um, you're at a significant disadvantage because 
um, when you align for parallelism between the cantilever and your alignment mark, how do you know that your eye is in the right position to assess for parallelism? That question is called parallax error. So with a mirrored protractor, you first get your eye in the right position by aligning visually the alignment mark and the reflection of the alignment mark. When they come, when they come into position like that, then you know your eye is in the right position to assess for a cantilever alignment. But if they're like this and you don't know it, you could align your cantilever very differently. Uh, Rick, did you have your hand up again? Do you have another question? Yeah, uh, following up kind of unlike what Ar Arnas was talking about, when, when the uh, stylus goes through the groove, I, I can understand why there are physical limitations that it doesn't uh, uh, pick up all of the information. But is it also a case that there are like microseconds in which case the stylus is actually disconnected with one wall or the other? Okay. Um, so I, I am aware that um, uh, Peter Letterman, who I already said I've got a lot of respect for, um, has talked about this stylus jitter. And, and it sounds very plausible, but um, I'm not aware of any proof. Um, it sounds pl plausible, right? But I, 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 I want to see some proof. Okay, thank you. Okay, all right. Now, um, JR, going back on, you were talking about uh, listening for the difference between a 33 and a 45, on the, yeah. particularly on the inner grooves. And that was for correcting the zenith error. Was that, that was for evaluating for the possibility because it's okay. You've got significant zenith error. Okay, issues. and um, of course we th there's the issue of the groove velocity in the first place. Are you listening to the inner grooves because the the inner groove because the, at the outside of the record the velocity is so much greater anyway? And I and would put it slightly different. Okay, um, differently. Um, First of all, it's the inner groove area of the 33. I don't care where it is on the 45, okay? There's the inner groove, innermost groove of the 33 that you can get. The further, closer to get to the label, the better. Um, and yes, the, the reason for that has to do with signal density per a unit of measure. So, so to play, you know, the, to play the duration of a quarter note, over a in, on a 45 RPM record at the outer area of the record. That's, that's a lot of groove. But to play that same quarter note at, on a 33 RPM in the, towards the interior of the record is much shorter, which means that the peaks and undulations of the, 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 the groove content are much closer together. Remember, it's this. The stylus doesn't change size, sizes or much alignment between the out, outer and the inner. So it's, gonna, it's going to see the terrain um, in a different way when it's densely packed and will increase the probability of that vertical excursion on a horizontally modulated group. And by the way, if you've got a perfectly vertically horizontally, I'm sorry, a perfectly vertically modulated group, which is an out of phase left and right signal, by the way. Um, with a stylus with a zenith there, you would get left and right. It forces that. So they, they, they both work in tandem. Mm -hmm. the so the idea of me getting out a 33 and a 45 and going back and forth while I change the, off, the offset angle of my tone arm and then listen again and make some notes and then so change it in the other direction and listen again and make some notes. I mean, my head, my head is exploding. Is, that's not the way I want to live my life. And, and, and I don't like subjective tests for something that can be measured mechanically either. And I, I'm, I'm just trying to give, I'm just trying to give the, my best idea I got Mm -hmm. to do it as cheaply as possible to assess for the possibility of zenith there. Right? Mm -hmm. And 
once if you can discern if there's a big difference on on those parameters that I mentioned, soundstage, image, imaging specificity, et cetera, et cetera, between the inner 33 and anywhere on a 45, then yeah, can you then put away the 45 RPM record if you feel that there's this big difference, and then focusing just on the 33 and on the innermost uh, 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 tracks, you can begin experimenting if you like. You know, I just, I, I don't, I, it makes me uncomfortable to say I'm the only one that I know of right now that can measure Zenith. So I'm trying to get a way out. Right. And yes, I'm, I'm, I'm working on a solution. So that, that's, that's the impetus behind that. So, well, so that brings up the question, what, we haven't even talked about the tools that you make to, to do this stuff. Do you want, do you want to like, give us a rundown of, of the products you offer? Well, the two basics are the Wally Tractor, which is the protractor, right? And it's, it's good for any arm, even a linear, linear tracker. Um, and why would you want it on a linear tracker? Well, <clears throat> you still want to use you still want to use a mirrored protractor to align that cantilever properly because if that's off, um, then let's, let's say if your cantilever is off on a linear tracker, one degree, two degrees, it's going to be two degrees off the whole way or one degree off the whole way. Whereas at least with a pivot tone arm, it has a chance of being right at least twice somewhere, <laughs> right? Um, and the, the Wally skater, the, that's the other basic item. The Wally skater and the Wally tractor are the two elemental ones. This is the this is the device used to measure horizontal forces on the tonar, um, and is Wally used to call it his uh, Trojan horse, because when you go to the shows and the the various dealers or manufacturers would ask him to come in and evaluate their setups in advance of of the show opening, he basically like, are you sure? because I'm bringing my Wally skater and we could find problems. I was with them when we found one turntable by this manufacturer that was unplayable because it had this powerful force that we couldn't counteract. Um, and there's a Wally, Wally reference, which are a series of blades that are used to uh, do a number of things. For one, perfectly level the head shell with the surface of the record at the height of your cartridge at your nominal tracking force. And then the single bladed ones, depending on the type of tone arm to measure what are those angles that you've arrived at for ideal rake angle and azimuth angle. So as to make it repeatable. All right. Um, and uh, the Wally Zenith looks very much like the Wally tractor, but is, is uh, helped it is if you know what your zenith error is, then you can purposefully misalign the cantilever to achieve the proper relationship between the groove contact edges and the the the, the stylus contact uh, groove, the groove contact the groove and the stylus contact edge. I did see one question here from Pete. <clears throat> yes, I was going to bring that up. Go ahead. Yeah. And it ties into what he's saying. He's saying basically, if, if if I'm gonna purposefully misalign the cantilever to account for <clears throat> a misalignment <clears throat> between the stylus contact edges, the stylus, uh, rather the groove contact edges, if I'm gonna purposely misalign the cantilever, aren't I screwing up other things in, in the motor assembly? Well, um, eventually you will. Okay, so we, we did some calculations on this too. If that angle of your correction, your zenith correction, becomes too much, then what will start happening is the groove content will want to, a stereo groove content, will want to push the cantilever in and out. Well, it's not designed to do that. And in most cases, it doesn't do that. Um, but you'd have to get to angles greater than the head shell would allow for that to be an issue. Most head shells will allow four and a half to five degrees of revolution, and that's it, right? So, um, and the amount, the amount of, of 
of changes to the electrical um, input that the, the electrical out output that the cartridge motors see as a result of five degrees is absolutely negligible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Jeff Gross, go ahead. You had a question? Yeah, I just have a quick question. I wondered if uh, you would say a little bit about um, Shibata and fine line uh, styli versus uh, micro ridge and micro line, that kind of thing. A lot of these are brand names, and I'm not sure what all of them mean. Shibata, that's pretty clear. It's just basically they're taking a <clears throat> conical stylus and they put a couple facets on the on the leading edge um, that ostensibly create a fine line. Shibata stylus are kind of my my bane because they're really difficult to measure, even with uh, a good microscope. They have to be illuminated just right. Um, and, and, and so they're, they're a bit of an irritant for me, but they're certainly better than uh, for playback, as long as you can get them aligned well, than a, um, a, Shabbat, a, 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 a elliptical or a conical. Um, so the other is, you know, micro ridge, um, fine line, these things don't really mean a whole lot. What you'll want to pay attention to in the specs is the, the, the minor radius and the major radius. Okay, so I like to see a minor radius less than five degrees. Uh, um, degrees, five microns. All right, and those many manufacturers will publish those. So I like to see definitely less than five microns, ideally somewhere between two and a half and three and a half, ideally. The reason why, and we've got, we've modeled this up in um, in in finite element analysis. So this. This uh, 1001 scale model, this is a four micron radius, all right? And this is the model that we used in the finite element analysis uh, software, this exact uh, stylus model. What we do see is because, the, uh, because of this four micron radius, even when this is perfectly aligned, there is a tiny bit of vertical excursion is enough to make a difference sonically? I, I don't know, but we can see it mechanically. Where when we trim it down to three microns, there's less. Okay, so, right? so basically, mimicking the cutter head stylus is is the ideal. You want to mimic those those that alignment and those rate and that, those radius. So basically, in a nutshell, smaller is better because you're getting closer to the contours yeah. of the group. Yeah. Yes. Now on the major radius, I, I like to go bigger. Um, 30, 30 micron um, is a little tight. And it, I mean, I, I've got one playing right now. I mean, it sounds great. I'm not saying it's, it's bad. It's just, it's, why do I say it's tight? Mm. And it, it has nothing to do with the way it sounds. I, 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 I could, I'm sure I couldn't tell the difference between a 70 micron major radius and a 30 micron major, major radius. But, um, and I got nothing to back this up on, but I'm thinking, well, the larger radiuses will be more gentle on the groove because there's more surface contact area, but the same amount of force. But the one that I'm playing that does currently have a 30 micron radius, it also has a tracking force of 1.2. So, you know, give and take. Ron Nagel. All right. I've, um, in the past, I purchased a phosgometer. Yeah. Fosgate's way of measuring the output of left and right channels and adjusting a vertical azimuth to equalize the output of the, the voltage output of a left and right channel. Yeah. Now, when I have those pretty much equal, how, am I very, very close to no zenith area, error? Oh, um, we'll have no idea. Um, you'll have no idea. Um, the, any crosstalk measurements, uh, uh, any single set of crosstalk, crosstalk measurements won't give you any idea of how your zenith area is doing. Um, these are two, you wanted to say something, Rod? Yeah, I don't believe that uh, that phosgometer is 
Uh, he's got a separate device that will uh, try to eliminate crosstalk in a cartridge, but the phosgometer itself just strictly uh, measures the output of the left channel, and then another track uh, measures the output of the right channel. Yeah. And you're supposed to adjust the cartridge to make them as close to equal as possible. That That's doesn't right. imply that they're one is interfering with the other in that instance. Yeah, um, so if your Zenith error, I've, I've tested this multiple times, if your Zenith error is off, you will get different crosstalk rating, readings. So let's, let's say, let, let, let me give you an example. Okay, let's say Zenith, there's no Zenith error, perfect Zenith error, I mean, perfect, perfect Zenith alignment. We use the physiometer and we determine that we dial in our azimuth angle and we're getting 28 dB crosstalk in the left channel and 28 dB crosstalk in the right channel. Perfect, right? That's great. That's what we want. Now, let's twist the cartridge in the head shell to introduce zenith error, okay? Now let's measure again. We didn't change azimuth, we just changed zenith. We're not gonna get 28 and 28 anymore. We're getting something quite different. All right. So, but, but the problem is most all of us, we don't know if we're starting out with zero Zenith error. Okay. How close am I getting to Zenith? Zero Zenith error. No idea. The Fuzzgometer won't give you any idea. Fuzzgometer will not give you any inclination about that. Okay. Now, if you are getting very, very low crosstalk readings, lower than you know you should. One possibility for that could be that your zenith there is way off. Could be. That's just one of a few possible reasons that you would get. Another, another thing I mentioned, I had this just, just yesterday and today, I had a Ortofon Anna Diamond in for analysis. And, um, my, my, my client had told me at level head shell, it's perfect, right? For, for azimuth, I'm talking about azimuth now. So I, I measured it and I saw that uh, it was about, it was less than three decibels off from each other. And for most people, that's, that's, that's acceptable. But then I started playing with it. I said, because that, why? Because I didn't like the overall, the, the absolute crosstalk level. It was too low. It was like 25 dB. And I know that cartridge can do better. It's like 25 dB and 28 dB or something like that. But I know this cartridge can do better. So I started tilting it and both channels were increasing crosstalk. We, remember, we want high crosstalk, right? Higher the number is the better. So both channels were increasing kind of together. And then after tilting quite a ways, they came into equilibrium. And instead of 25, 28, I was now at like 31 and 31. But my azimuth angle now was no longer level. I measured at one and three quarters degrees, which is visibly tilted. Make sure your physiometer is calibrated. So you would leave it at that visibly tilted because that is correct. Yeah, and, and then I did a subjective, uh, just, just because it doesn't happen very often, um, I did a subjective evaluation. I put it back to level, listened to it to, to where I measured it was better, and I definitely liked the, the tilt better. Now, that, that I also, the other reason why I do that is that when I start to have a steep angle like that on my azimuth, I want to make sure, again, remember the major radius, remember this radius here, if that's, uh, if that's too flat, if the, if the radius is too big, it's going to be very unforgiving to riding in the groove like this. Yeah. It's going to be very unforgiving. So uh, I wanted to make sure that I wasn't hearing anything unusual out of one channel or the other. A lot of us like to play with the height of the tone arm. Yeah. And because there's no definitive uh, perfect, I, I mean, even if you have the microscope, there's no definitive best stylus rake angle, I take right. it. Um, what do you listen for subjectively 
if you're trying to tune that? Huh. Um, I don't. Because, because there are too many other variables you're changing when you change tone arm height. So you're not just listening to the changes of break. I don't. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that uh, zenith changes in zenith and changes in azimuth have a greater uh, sonic impact, degree for degree, than than rake. Um, notice I didn't say a greater sonic impact for changing tone arm height. <laughs> now, stop me if I, I've told you this, but um, most tone arms. Most tone arms, when you change tone arm height to impact your rake, you're also changing azimuth. And on most tone arms, you're also changing the vertical tracking force when you change the tone arm height. And when you change the vertical tracking force, you're changing the coefficient of friction with the stylus of the groove. And when you change coefficient of friction, you're changing skating force. And when you change skating force, you're changing the force at which that you're going to change the cantilever angle. When you change the cantilever angle, you change the zenith angle. It's all interrelated. Unfortunately, there's no like mm. simple Fisher Price answer. Right. So for years, uh, we all like to play with our tone arm height and think we're doing the uh, stylus rake angle change. And somebody says, oh, I think on that female vocal, you need to lower your tone arm a little bit. And so you go do it and it sounds different and you go, Yay, that was, that was it. We fixed the stylus rake angle and that's not what happened at all. I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that you've changed a number of things. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and it, 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 you may be able to make it sound better. I'm not gonna argue with that. But what my, I take, um, my concern is that, you're, is that many people uh, attribute the changes to rake angle changes. And uh, we've done, you know, we've started to do the finite element analysis on rake, and we so far haven't found, uh, we found very little mechanical difference between how the stylus travels through the groove when you change rake angle. Very little difference. Not like Zenith, where there's a huge difference. Yeah, that doesn't mean that we won't find it somewhere in the magnet assembly or something like that, but hmm. a lot more research to do. Okay. Uh, Jeff Gross, uh, you had another question? Yeah, just a, a quick one here. Um, I'm sort of a fan of uh, Rega equipment. Um, and you mentioned uh, that, it, that it relies on, um, you know, an alignment scheme that yes. is, you know, questionable, let's say. So yeah. if I'm buying, if I, you know, if I'm shopping for Rega gear, um, what, you know, what uh, aspects are, so to speak, uh, you know, contaminated by this, this alignment okay. scheme? First of all, I, 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 I want to say that the Rega tables are great, okay? Um, and there's nothing wrong with Rega tables at all. It's the alignment scheme that they're using, which is easily defeatable, okay? Ah. Easily okay. defeatable. You aren't, you're only locked into it if you use that third head, head shell screw. Oh, I see. Okay. okay? So if you that, You're only locked into it if you're using that. Um, uh, and and that third head shell screw assumes a lot. It assumes that the cantilever is properly aligned with the body, right? And right. then all the rest of it too. You know, forget about the stylus. But I regularly okay. see cantilevers not perfectly aligned with the body. Regularly. Um, so uh, so uh, it's not a knock on Rega, okay? Uh, but I think that that the Stevenson alignment was a bad choice but they're great products other, other than that choice, which is defeatable. Okay. So it's easily, easily, easy to defeat if you know what you're doing, which I if don't you've got, yet. If you've got but, the right protractor to get out, to get out of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Marvin, go ahead. Okay. Hi. Uh, Hi thanks for, for giving us all this uh, valuable information. You, uh, it's it's uh, very enlightening. Uh, I have a, a brief question. Could you touch on the advantages or difficulties with the linear tracking arms with respect to these yeah. alignments? Um, so, so clearly, theoretically, having a, a linear tracker is the best way to recreate, it, it, to transcribe the material that the cutter had stylus laid down. Um, 
but it comes with at a significant engineering expense because in order to get it traveling in a straight line, well, there are, there are two main ways to do it. One is by using things like a Thales circle or, or the, um, the uh, um, well, I'm drawing a blank on the, on the fellow's name, but there's a number of pivoted linear track, trackers out there, right? Um, that are, that are um, trying to do just this. I'll focus on the, the linear bearing ones in a moment, but the linear pivoted tone arms, like the, uh, the Schroeder one, right? And Frank's, Frank's a freaking smart guy. Um, um, it, 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 there's always an engineer, in everything you do, there's an engineering trade-off. So as I see it, the engineering trade-off in designs like the, um, the linear pivoted trackers is that you're introducing a number of, um, uh, you're introducing more parts that will reduce rigidity. The ideal tone arm has an infinite mass. It won't move for any, at any level or any frequency, All right? Obviously that's not practical, okay? And why, why is that important? Why, why would it, that be ideal? Because you don't wanna rob the cartridge of its energy, right? So with cartridge, it's, it's busy doing its thing and it is throwing a lot of energy. The more, the easier you make it for the, for the tone arm to take, to shunt that energy out and absorb it or diffuse it or somewhere else, you're robbing the motor from being able to see that energy, okay? So, and, and that has a number of sonic impacts. Um, and so the more moving parts that you introduce to allow for a linear pivoted to trace the to trace the, um, the, the radial line, the more, as I see, the increased probability of robbing the motor, robbing the motor from some information. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a, a trade-off. Now with the linear trackers, well, there's been, mo most designs have not been very successful uh, because, I've, and I've seen some of very expensive ones in the past where, and you probably heard Michael Bremer talk about this, and I've seen it, they, they crab walk. Some of them crab walk across the surface. So it's just a, a series of miniature arcs. How many degrees off were they? I, I don't know, I've never measured it. I don't plan to. Then there's the air bearing ones. Um, air bearing ones have to be really careful with the design of those because, because they can offer the same, you want, remember, you want rigidity. You want rigidity. How, how easily can, uh, how easy is it to for the, the that bearing to just move in micro amounts in sympathy with with the from the energy of the cantilever and thereby rob the motor from from getting the signal. This is question marks, all right. So it, that it's difficult, very difficult to engineer that out to have the, those linear bearings to be really rigid. Um, th those air bearings, particularly the air bearings. So. Um, I forgot something else I was going to say. Does that answer your question? More or less, yeah. That that that's good. And and secondly, um, tracking force um, is that like a moving target with these adjustments, in your opinion, or is there going to be an ideal tracking force? Oh, um, how do you get there? And the, the the tracking force is entirely dependent upon the cartridge design because what once what's the once the stylus meets meets the record and, and the tracking force has been applied. What you want is you want that coil assembly that you saw the, mm -hmm. the animation of to be, to be at the, uh, the right angular relationship with the magnetic field around it, all right? So a lot of, a lot of what you're doing, um, you're doing two things when you change tracking force. One, you're changing the effect of compliance, okay? Um, because the more you compress that, the more you, compress by adding force, the more you compress the, the um, pliable material that makes up the suspension, the harder it gets, all right? So that will change the sound. And, and, the, and the more you change the vertical tracking force, the more you change that angular relationship between the coils and the, the magnetic flux field. So the, I, I'm not, I don't know if there's any ideal. It, it's all based on how the designs are, you know, the, the, the Hannah was 
um, they track at less than one gram, um, particularly if you're using a, a current gain photo stage. And, um, and you know, that's what they're designed for. That's, they sound great, but then you know, you've got uh, the Ortofon Anod that tracks at 2.4. Um, there's nothing wrong with either one. It's different approaches, different designs internally. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank, thanks very much. You're welcome. Yeah, Don, uh, go ahead. You can ask again. Assuming that my uh, cartridge is set up pretty properly by the professionals that I bought it from, some of the vinyl that I play is thin, you know, the Dynaflex pieces of junk, and then some of it is the uh, original CBS Blue Label Masterworks that are about 240 gram weight, so they're much thicker. I didn't is know there, that. Is, is there anything for, to be gained by me learning how to adjust uh, the vertical something or other um, yeah. between playing thin and thick vinyl? Yeah. yeah. So my position on that is no. So okay. I, I don't know. I've never heard of a record at 2.4 millimeters. Um, that I, I would like to see one of those. Oh, no, you said 240. You said 240 gram. Yeah. Yeah, those old original CBSs that are... Huh. They're, they're thicker than a 200 gram. Wow. Uh, okay. Well, there is an IEC standard for the thinnest and the thickest record. Okay. And if you take those standards, and I don't know where the CBS falls in that, but if, if you take the difference between the thinnest and the thickest record, it's slightly, it, it's ju I remember, just under uh, one and a half millimeters difference. Okay. But few people play the Dynaflex flab ones that are those really thin ones, right? Very few. <laughs> um, if you take the bulk of records played, the difference between the thickest and thinnest is about one millimeter, okay? That most of us have in our collection and play, right? Okay. Um, so what does that mean? What does that one millimeter mean? Here's what it means. On a nine inch tone arm, it's a quarter degree difference in rake angle. I challenge anybody to hear a difference. I don't think I could. Good. So I, I don't have to be. Much. So I don't have to be neurotic about no, how thick please don't. thin. Please don't. Okay. Please so, don't. I'm, I'm 67 years old. I've owned a turntable since I was 17, starting with an old Girard SL65 back in yeah. 1970, and a yeah. Biogram, the original Bo3000. Yeah. I've never adjusted anything. I always leave it to the professional that I buy it from, and I've always been happy. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. Very Being good. Happy is a good thing. Good question. Uh, uh, we're going to wrap this up soon, but Arnie, uh, go ahead. Do you have another question? Well, this is sort of along the lines of wrapping up things, but I wanted to thank this presentation. I thought it was enlightening, very, very educational, because uh, whatever I know about vinyl reproduction had not been discussed to this degree. Uh, so far. And so I'm glad that basically, <laughs> like the song goes, I'm glad there's you. because uh, uh, This is only, I'm sure that the, you know, like the, the beginning of things that you're going to do and your approach is very, very analytical. And I love that uh, analytical part and so on. And I also want to thank Mark for getting you to, or inviting you to do this presentation because I'm sure all of us learned a lot. Thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoy talking about it, and I I, I like to uh, help spread the word. It, it's fun. I, I love researching this stuff. Like I said before, the more I learn about it, the more I realize how much I don't know. There's there's a, a there's a it's a miracle, as I said, to what we can get from the grooves, and most of us um, haven't reached it. There's a lot there. It's amazing. So uh, Pete, go ahead uh, before we wrap up. You had a question? Yeah. Um, I thought I heard you say that uh, there wasn't a good way to set the tone arm height. Uh, do we just follow the owner's manual and uh, use the measurement, you know, physical measurement technique? So, or did I miss something? So uh, there's not a good way to set tone arm height. Um, so uh, I believe what I, what I was trying to convey is that when you change, and, and you can stop me if this is not the road that you were going down, 
there, when you change tone arm height, you're changing a multiplicity of different parameters. So you aren't hearing just changes in rake angle. You're hearing a multiplicity of things. By changing tone arm height, you could be, depending on the type of tone arm, you could be screwing up your asthma. Uh, depending on your tone arm type, most of them anyway, you, you could be making big changes to your, your tracking force, which will impact your, ultimately impact your cantilever angle, right? Um, uh, where I already, where I always have people start out is with a perfectly level cartridge and that's using the Wally reference. Um, I don't know where that went. And to perfectly level, that's the starting point. That's the reference. That's Okay, that, that. that answers it, yeah. But um, also, it sounds like almost everything interacts with each other. So if you change the tone arm height, you run through, it's iterative. You run through all the other uh, adjustments. And Which then is you exactly the evaluation. Exactly. And I know it sounds frustrating, but that's exactly why I insist on univariate analysis, right? Focus measure the one parameter you care about and measure it directly, all right? So that's why I measure rake directly with a microscope. That's why I measure zenith directly with the microscope. And I'll, I'm, and I'll make that more available to other people when I can get the product together. Um, the one area you can't measure directly is, is azimuth. And remember, of the three parameters, and, and, and of course, Horizontal, horizontal forces on the tone arm, right? Let's not guess how much force we're putting on the tone arm with our anti-skating device. Let's measure it. And let's also make sure the tone arm doesn't have its own forces pushing one way or another. To assess this stuff by ear is, I, I wouldn't have any fun in this hobby. If, if, if I had to assess it all by ear, could I make it better by assessing it by ear? Sure. but. I know that when it comes to horizontal force, zenith, and uh, azimuth, there is a measurable ideal. We know what to aim for. So let's aim for it. When it comes to rake, well, again, the best science that's out there says 92 degrees. Until we do our own studies, that's what I'm going to aim for right now. And well, we are starting our studies. We've already begun those studies. But that's what I'm, the best science that's out there right now says 92 degrees. They don't say whether it's dynamic or static. I've decided to make it dynamic and that's what I'm doing, right? So where you can measure for ideal, do so. That's my position. And then stop worrying about it and just listen. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, so to give you a commercial plug, uh, I want to encourage everybody to go to uh, wallyanalog.com, I believe is the uh, website, and uh, look over all the products that JR offers, because uh, they're all uh, the top of the line for setting up. The Wally, scope is, the Wally scope is almost ready for release. So, so tell us about that. Is that going to be the next product we should look forward to? Yeah, and I'm going to make it available for rent as well to Wally Tools owners. So rent or, or, or sale. Um, and yes, so it's basically, it's, it's a high school level microscope that's been torn apart to its guts. I got three lenses, a two times, four times, and 10 times. And um, I put it on an XYZ stage so you can control the height, find focus, and left and right. With the, there's a control right there. And, another control right there, and then the height control. And then the scope, the, the, rather this camera is fantastic. It's really, really light sensitive. What's important in, um, in digital microscopy isn't, so isn't the uh, pixel rating. Don't believe, these, these USB microscopes are, can't be believed. The stats can't be believed. The, their magnification, it's a joke. They, they aren't as powerful as they say they are. And the pixelation doesn't matter. It's how big is the light receptor? So this one's got like a half inch, almost 
So it's, the, it's as with most cameras, it's the sensor that's important. Yes. Yeah. Not the not the pic. I don't care so much. I don't. And actually, is, lots of pixels on a small sensor is shit. Yes, it you is. You just get noise. You just get noise. Absolutely. So I think this is only like a one point nine pix megapixel rate. Fine, gives a great image. Really light sensitive. So yeah. would you be giving? like a family plan for rental of those like to an audio club or something and uh, do have you worked out how you're gonna how you're gonna rent those out i'm not entirely yet i'm uh you know I'm, unfortunately because it, it's for for the purchase price it's pretty expensive because that's a nice camera and this is 1250 but i'm gonna rent it out for 300 and i i'm i'm i know i'm gonna be pretty generous with the time um i haven't figured out where it's gonna be you know i I certainly would like to get it back in less than a month. <laughs> All right. um, but uh, yeah, that's going to, that, that almost, almost ready to, to release that. Oh, that and would be great. That, I, I'm, I have one of the menu items on the website is the Wally School, where I've got blogs on very, a lot of the stuff that I talked about today, not everything. Um, we put articles and videos there. So take a look at that. Yeah. And all of the products have uh, videos um, on how to install them and use them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, last question, Ron Nagel. Yeah, uh, you showed us your microscope camera combination, but uh, you didn't exactly tell us what it can correct. Does it uh, have more than one correction ability? Okay, so it, it is principally designed to uh, measure dynamic stylus rake angle. Okay, but the the particular the uh, ten times lens is powerful enough to assess for even stylus wear, um, and and just overall general condition of the stylus. It's if you get your illumination uh, pretty good with with the two smaller lenses, you probably don't even need much illumination at all. Um, but the with the more powerful lens it, with some good illumination. You should be able to see if you got that gel gunk on your stylus. Yeah. So does that answer your question? So it's principally for stylus rake, but I'm working on one other idea to make it more functional for something else. Well, thank you. Yeah. Cool. All right. JR, thanks so much for your time. We've kept you here almost two and a half hours, I think. Uh, and we really appreciate your generosity. Welcome. And uh, as I've said before, I, I love learning about this stuff. I think it's fascinating, and I hope everybody else enjoyed it as much as I did. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, everybody. Um, any questions, email me or call me. Number's on the website. Very good. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mark.